Well, thank you very much for the, the invitation to speak here. And um, yeah, it's a really a, a pleasure to be giving a seminar in front of this very distinguished audience. So I'm going to be speaking, as you can see, about Iwasawa theory for the symmetric square of a modular form. But because I'm aware that, th that um, the number theory group here covers quite a wide range of interests, I thought I'd start by giving you a, th a brief summary of what Iwasawa theory is and the kind of things one hopes to prove with Iwasawa theory before concentrating on the, on the specific case where we can actually do something new. So this is in some sense a, continu a continuation of Sarah's talk two weeks ago, but the introductory material should, uh, should maybe have gone before Sarah's talk, I'm not sure. So roughly, the idea of Iwasawa theory, going back to the original work of Iwasawa himself, is that if you're interested in the arithmetic of number fields or of objects over number fields, sometimes it becomes smoother and more regular and easier to study when you make a, when you make a tower of number field extensions. So the, ba the basic case of this goes right back to, I think, 1950s. If you take any number field k, we maybe can't say very much about the about the size of the class group of k. Let's choose a prime and just look at the p part. But if you join more and more p power roots of unity to k. Sorry, I, I want to look at just the p part of this. You get a very regular behavior. So for some constants, the, the power of p dividing, um, dividing the, cl the, the class no number is given by lambda n plus mu p to the n plus a constant for all sufficiently large n. So the algebraic machinery d driving this is a very sim simple um, ring theoretic statement. If you look at the module, the, lim the inverse limit of the class groups, I te tensor with ZP to kill the non-P part, Obviously, each of the things at finite level is a module over the corresponding Galois group. But the important point is that although these group rings are quite messy and nasty rings, the object you get in the limit is a really beautiful and simple object. basically is a finite sum of copies of the power series ring and one variable over ZP, classify modules over it very easily, and 
And once you know that this module C is a torsion module over lambda, then from the classification of such modules, um, this theorem of Iwasawa is virtually immediate. warm in here. So this led to the general idea that you should study lots of other arithmetic objects in towers of number fields like this one and look for modules that you could prove were, were torsion over lambda and then apply the stru this structure theory of lambda modules to get, it to, to, um, to get this kind of asymptotic results. And you can do better than that Finally generated torsion modules over this ring, there's a, a canonical invariant attached to them which is the characteristic ideal. And this intuitively measures how big the, the module is. It's an ideal of lambda. And Iwasawa's conjecture is that generator. Now technically this isn't actually what the conjecture says. I should put the minus eigenspace for complex conjugation if I want to have a conjecture. And so the theorem says, and this was it was ours conjecture, and it's now a theorem due to Mazur and Wiles, Let's just take k equals q here, and then the theorem of Mazur Wiles says that the, the characteristic power the characteristic ideal of C is generated by a certain power series whose values interpolate the values um, of the Riemann zeta function. So this is what we call the Piadic zeta function. So I'm sure um, pretty much everyone in, in the room knew, that, but this serves as motivation for what I'm going to say next. So I want to, to set up some analog of this for very general arithmetic objects over number fields, and the correct formalism is to use representations of Galois groups. I'm going to stick to the case of the base field being Q. So I want to take a finite gen finitely generated free ZP module with a continuous action of the absolute Galois group of Q. And just a technical point. <coughs> this group is a bit too big. So I want to, to choose a finite set of primes and look at cohomology with restricted ramification at only those primes. 
I'm going to complete that sentence in a moment. How does this work? Choose a finite set of primes, and I'm going to want to assume P is one of them, and I look only at representations of Galois groups that are unramified outside the, the primes in sigma. And it will become clear in a moment why I want to do that. So I'm going to define the Iwasawa cohomology of T to be the inverse limit of the cohomology of T over all cyclotomic fields, over all p-power cyclotomic fields. Sorry, that should be general degree i. And these are rather obviously modules over the ring lambda. And it turns out that they're always finitely generated. And in fact, they're only ever non-zero in two specific degrees, in degree one and two. Uh, sorry, I missed something. I, I was going to. I said I, it would become obvious in a moment why I, can, I made this re ramification restriction, and I forgot to say it. Yeah. Otherwise, these would not have been finitely generated because you would have all sorts of extra junk coming from um, from. So, so this, uh, from one other by uh, yes, so this is with respect to the norm map. There's, limit, there's a co-restriction map from n, n plus 1 to n, and you take the inverse limit with respect to that. So now let me write down a very, very vague conjecture. And it's very vague because I'm not going to define precisely most of the objects appearing in it. <coughs> so if I take a, a nice T, one that occurs in the et al. cohomology of some algebraic variety, then this H2 should be torsion. There should be some special elements in the H1 Iwasawa which should be related to values of L functions by, by a map I'll just I'll write down. And this is inverse limit of cohomology over Q, but you can also do the same thing with, um, with cohomology of cyclotomic extensions of QP, and there's a localization map.
And out of here you have various maps coming from, um, from Piatic Hodge theory called Coleman maps. landing in the ring lambda itself and we expect to have elements in here whose image in here is in some sense a periodic L function. The final um, piece of this is a sort of abstract formulation of, of an Iwasawa main conjecture in this context. We've, we've asserted that the H2 should be torsion so we can form its characteristic ideal and the claim is that that should be equal to the characteristic ideal of H1 Iwasawa modulo the submodule generated by the special elements. So this is maybe a little unlike the, the sorts of things that one is used to, to seeing as main conjectures in Iwasawa theory. Um, there's a, a more traditional approach to Iwasawa theory which involves, which involves H1 of have some representation that looks like the Tate dual of, of um, of, um, of T and in fact there's a relation between this H to Urosawa and the cohomology of, of the Tate dual of T which is how one is how one somehow traditionally formulated Urosawa main conjectures but then you have to deal with the fact your modules are co-finitely generated rather than finitely generated so I prefer this setup because it's somehow you're always working with finitely generated modules the two pictures are more or less equivalent I'm just going to say that. I'm just about to give an example. So if I take T to be the first tape twist of the trivial representation, so in other words it's it's ZP as a set, but with Galois acting via the cyclotomic character. So the finite levels in this um, in this inverse limit that v defines the Urasawa cohomology are just unit groups. The cohomology of this representation is given by the Kummer map coming from a group of units. Or more accurately, it's a group of things that are units outside the, the bad prime sigma where I've allowed uh, some degree of ramification. But in this case, I could just take sigma to be, to, to be consisting only of p. Sorry, tensor zp.
So if you look at z to p to the n minus 1, that's a, a unit outside p, and p is assumed to be in sigma, so that's fine. And at least for n greater than or equal to 1, these are compatible under the norm maps. And so that defines an element in the, uh, in the Iwasawa cohomology. which I'm going to say is the first example of one of these special elements. And it was shown by, um, I believe, by Coleman. that under his map, this gets sent to the p-adic zeta function. And now, up to a small grain of salt, and this grain of salt is closely related to why I, have to do, I had to have the minus part of c over there, up to a small grain of salt, it's, it's the inverse limit of class groups. And now one has a reformulation of the main conjecture saying that the index of the cyclotomic units in the full gr group of, of units, or units outside p, is controlled by the values of, of a p-adic zeta function. And without, maybe without writing anything, I'll give another not quite example but near example this idea that you should have a special element in H1 um, that is related to L values, and then the index of that special element in H1 is related to H2, should seem very familiar to those of you who have been studying um, local indivisibility of Higner points and so on, where the special element is the Higner point, and there's a relation between the size of Sha, which is some kind of H2 in this viewpoint, and the index of the special element in H1. Well, it's it's related to the to the Selma group with the zero local condition. I I said this would be vague. Okay, so that was an, a, a brief sketch of what's expected for Iwasawa theory for a general Galois representation. And now let me say something about a tool you can use to prove parts of this. I'm just going to remind you of some things that were mentioned in Sarah's talk. And I will remind you or tell you for people who weren't there. So a class in H1 Iwasawa is the same thing as norm-compatible classes over all p-power cyclotomic fields. So Euler systems. Uh, uh, oh yeah, sorry, K has been Q since since at least the beginning of section two.
So you can put in auxiliary primes um, away from, uh, from P as well. And there should be norm compatibility relations, which are much more elaborate than having just exact norm compatibility on the nail. These involve involve Euler factors, but only at the primes not in sigma. So in particular, if you have such a system, so your core model is still the Q sigma. Um, I mean, your Euler system. Uh, yes, this is all. This is all for abelian extensions of Q. I mean, Q sigma. You have started with Q sigma. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm fixing a sigma for the. Yeah, sorry, you're, you're correct. I've, I'm, f I'm fixing a sigma outside which T is unramified, which will remain fixed for pretty much the whole talk. So there's a natural map from Euler systems, which is somehow forget the Q mu m's, forget the Q zeta m's, except when m is a power of p. And you go into to H1 over hour. But it's important that this is um, probably not probably not injective and very certainly not surjective in general. So you're forgetting a huge amount of, inf of information, but also not every class in here can be extended to an Euler system. This is not very surprising because when you do have when you do have classes in H1 that come from Euler systems, then there's an inductive argument ultimately due to and uh, uh, Kolivagin and much extended by Rubin. So if you have something in H1 Iwasawa that does come from some um, Euler system, then you get a bound on the H2, which you can regard as a as some kind of approximation to um, to this main conjecture we've got up here. So you look at the size of the torsion subgroup of Z in the Iwasawa cohomology, uh, sorry, of H1 Iwasawa modulo Z. So this is somehow measuring how much you can divide Z by inside the Iwasawa cohomology, and you get and that bounds above the, the size of the H2. You certainly need some st strong hypotheses here. I mean, otherwise, if you didn't have an irreducibility hypothesis, you could somehow get uh, something for nothing by taking an Euler system for T1 and then just applying the theorem to T1 plus T2 or something. So yeah, so you certainly need T to be irreducible here. And there are actually many other hypotheses I'm, I'm sweeping under the carpet. But I'm going to talk in a moment about the case where this one is not satisfied. So 
And just briefly, we expect that, uh, that in the conjecture I outlined here, these special elements should in fact come from Euler systems. And then this machinery of Polyvagin and Rubin in many <coughs> cases allows you to prove one, one divisibility towards this. The left hand side divides the right. And so you have one, um, one inclusion in the main conjecture. And of course, it's. Um, so the conjecture should be, should be kind of equal, right? Uh, sorry? Conjecture, you know, you prove the one divisibility. Uh, yes, you, you, want, you want these things to be equal, but you prove one divides the other. Uh, where was I? Next. So now I'll introduce, um, I'll, I'll introduce the particular representation we want to work with. And since now um, I'll actually start mentioning some theorems. This, I should say this is all joint work with Sarah. So take some modular form F. I've, I want it to be an eigenform, evidently, so I can form the associated Galois representation. Uh, for simplicity, let's assume that F has coefficients in, in some number field that embeds into ZP. And otherwise, this would just be a module over some slightly larger um, extension of, Z, of ZP rather than ZP itself. I want to study the symmetric square of, the, of TF, which is a three-dimensional representation of, of GQ. So if you recall from, uh, from Sarah's talk, we do have an, an Euler system associated to pairs of modular forms. So for any two forms f and g, We've got an Euler system for the four-dimensional representation uh, TF tensor TG. And Sarah used this to prove some results about, um, about main conjectures for this representation, but only in cases where th this representation was actually irreducible, so you could apply the, the theorems on, on that board. So what we get here is an Euler system for, a, um, for the direct sum of a three-dimensional and a one-dimensional representation. 
And you can imagine all sorts of things that could happen here. Um, if the Euler system classes actually all landed the cohomology of this one-dimensional subrepresentation, then obviously that would totally doom our chances of saying anything about the three-dimensional part. Um, yes, I'm assuming the weight is at least two now. Um, some of the results work for weight one, but um, I th I'm, not sh I'm not sure the symmetric square stuff does, and we certainly assumed for simplicity that, that the weight was at least two. And the problem is, that in, if the weight is one, then the, the, the L function of the symmetric square has no critical values. Right. So it's a lot harder to get the machinery off the ground. So the first, uh, the first thing to check is that we do actually get non-trivial classes in the symmetric square factor into some cases. So the Iwasawa cohomology groups where um, Euler systems live all have actions of complex conjugations. And the first thing we check is that the, the image in the plus one eigenspace lands in the determinants, the one dimensional factor. So in fact, our Euler system splits itself over the two um, direct sums to which complex conjugation eigenspace you want to go into. And this is really very fortunate. So the global duality of, of Galois cohomology, which somehow uh, relates via the main conjecture to the functional equation of, of L functions, interchanges the two signs. So in fact, it's sufficient to prove the main conjecture for either, um, for either sign eigenspace for complex conjugation. So uh, we just work in the minus one eigenspace, and then we can deduce results about the plus one eigenspace at the end using, using this duality. And of course, we want to know some relation between, uh, between the resulting elements and, um, and periodic L functions via these Coleman maps. That was the, uh, the framework we were expecting for general Galois representations. And we might hope to get the periodic L function symmetric square here. Unfortunately, we don't. This, this Euler system, even though we've projected it into the symmetric square factor, it somehow remembers that it came from the, from the whole of, uh, of TF tensor TF. I'm using Z to P for two different things. And so you get a, get a product of the L functions um, of these two factors. So this is just a character, so you get the periodic zeta function, and you get it multiplied by this. So 
So the results that Sarah described in her talk about relating, um, relating the Euler system for a general f and g to L functions tell us that what we should get here is the eidetic L function of the Rankine convolution of f with itself. But it's, and it seems very natural that this should have a factorization, but this actually turns out to be rather hard. But fortunately, it is known. It's a, th it's a theorem of Samit Dasgupta. And the interesting th thing is that, um, is that Samit's proof of this theorem relies very heavily on inspecting the image of the Euler system in this factor. But we're actually applying it to say something about this factor, and we're kind of transporting information between the two and um, using the, the functional equation again. So it might look like we're in good shape, and we can just wheel out the, machine of the, uh, the machinery of Euler systems, which I'm just about to rub away. <laughs> to get some kind of bound on, on, on H2s. And there's one small problem. And the problem is that this object is not actually an Euler system for the symmetric square. So we're now trying to bound the H2 Iwasawa. We got classes for the symmetric square of TF by projecting into TF an Euler system, sorry, the sim, projecting into sim squared TF an Euler system for TF tensor TF. So the norm compatibility relations that these satisfy are still the same norm compatibility relations that the Euler system here satisfied. So we get the wrong Euler factors. And this turns out to actually be a real disaster for, the, for using the Kolyvag and Rubin machinery to bound Selma groups, because you, in, in the proof of the, of the theorem, you choose a, a whole load of, um, of carefully chosen auxiliary primes and use those to, to, um, to build these derivative cohomology classes. And it turns out that, that for each of those primes, um, we end up getting a zero of the local Euler factor of the, of the extra Euler factor at that prime, and that precisely kills the, um, the Kolyvagin derivative class. We actually think, although we can't prove, that all of the Kolyvagin derivative classes for, this, um, for, for these uh, elements are zero. Uh, yes. Well, if we had a if we had a direct construction of of Euler systems for um, for Galois representations coming from automorphic representations of GL three, then we could just sort of throw that at the um, at the at the lifted object. Um, I would I would totally agree with you.
by using Python. I'm just pointing Yeah, it's it's a these extra degree one factors are are a problem all over the theory of symmetric square L functions, but this is somehow one more place where they're a problem. So alas, we cannot bound the, the H2 for the, um, for the symmetric square directly. We can still do something, which is somehow a, perhaps a, a poor substitute for that. So instead, we twist by a character. If you can construct an Euler system for t, you can construct one for any twist of t. It's, this, it's actually literally the same data. But it turns out that when you try and use it to bound the Selma groups of this, if you choose chi sufficiently nicely, then this problem doesn't arise. What's chi here? It's a Dirichlet character. <laughs> but there are some, going to be some pretty strong hypotheses on what chi can be. I should have mentioned, incidentally, Um, for the statements that I've made so far to be, to be correct on the nail, um, I want the Nabin type of f to be, um, to be trivial. Otherwise, the bad case here isn't when chi is, um, is 1, it's where chi is the inverse of the Nabin type of f. It's the case when, when the L function of this has a, has a uh, sorry, the L function of the determinant factor has a pole. So suppose a long list of hypotheses, f, p has got to not divide the level of, of f, and f has to, have, has to be ordinary at p. There are some problems for small primes. chi of p had better not be 1, otherwise you get some, some trivial zero phenomena. The, the p adic L function has extra zeros that it shouldn't have. And chi can't be trivial or quadratic. And there's another hypothesis, which is somehow the big one. Cross is a sub it is a subset of ZP, I believe. Um, and oh, and I want the conductor of. Um, the, the, the conductor of chi better be co prime to P. And I think I've now written up enough uh, enough and safely write down the conclusion. Uh, with our current methods, sadly it is. Um, we'd very much like to, to, to get rid of that, but we need to find, uh, we need to find nice elements in the image of Galois with, um, 
the condition is there has to be an image in an, an element in the image of Galois with one as an eigenvalue with multiplicity exactly one. And it seems to be quite hard to find these in the symmetric square. Um, because we also need to have it um, not being in the kernel of chi. And those conditions put together um, are very hard to satisfy. And we kind of messed around with group theory until we got bored. And these were the best conditions under which we can show it existing. It definitely doesn't exist if chi is trivial. So we actually work with a slightly modified Iwasawa cohomology group. It's in the whole. It's in the whole of. It's got to to have one as an eigenvalue with multiplicity one on the whole of T F tensor T F. And most of the obvious cons construction. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, TF tensor TF tensor chi, sorry. So we work with a slight modification of Iwasawa cohomology with technical reasons. And we get a divisibility of the right form. So the reason we work with this modified Iwasawa cohomology is that um, this H1 tilde is actually, is actually free of rank one. So we don't need to worry about passing to torsion subgroups. So this is clearly some, um, some non-trivial approximation to the, um, to the main conjecture in this context. But, I would, but one word of caution, we definitely do not expect this to be optimal in general. This, this should not be inequality. So our Euler system, we think, is not somehow the optimal Euler system for this twist of the symmetric square. There should be a, a better Euler system from which you can obtain hours by multiplying it by the periodic zeta function. And if you use the optimal Euler system, then you would expect to get, a, um, you would expect to get an equality here. And our result is then um, LP of chi times worse. However, there are. Um, at least reasonably many cases where the periodic, um, the periodic L function of chi turns out to be a periodic unit anyway. So in that case, in those cases, and only those cases, our result should be sharp. Um, yes, so we don't at present know how to construct this, this optimal Euler system, but we have a guess at what it might look like. No, the guess at what the the resulting elements should be. So it's the CMs are the the mth layer of our Euler system. expect there should be classes dm in the same thing. Such that cm is, is proportional to dm and the constant of proportionality, this is an element of, of some finite group ring, should be the Stickelberger element.
And this accounts for both the, the mysteriously warped norm compatibility relations we get, because the UNs themselves have a norm compatibility which involves exactly these, uh, th these one-dimensional extra factors, and also the factor that would contribute to the, um, to the regulator at P is exactly this, um, this P average ratio factor. So we don't know how to construct these elements, but this is why we expect our Euler system is off by a, somehow a constant factor from the optimal Euler system in this context. Okay, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for listening.